Alright, hi everybody. I'm Cage. This is Octavio, Matt, and Liam, and we're seeing Guy. There's a problem in this world, and it's blind and visually impaired people. There's um, a lot of them out there, and it's very hard for them to get from point A to point B with confidence by themselves, and um, that's the problem we're fixing. So there's 285 million visually impaired people in this world, and out of them, there's 39 million blind. All of them are part of the stats over here, from, taken from uh, Santa Fe University. Uh, as you can see, 42% have at least one accident a month, and 13% have more than that. So our competition, there's canes, stuff like that, but those don't predict like further ahead in the future. Uh, there's seeing eye dogs, but those are very, very expensive to train. But this is our main competition, ARIA by at and ARIA is a set of glasses that blind people wear. It streams to a guy at a desk, and that guy, what he does is he tells them what's coming up in front of them. So our product looks like this, like Octavio's has in his hand, in his uh, chest. Uh, it's very similar to ARIA. The only difference is we're cutting out the middleman. We're not gonna have a person at a desk telling the blind person what's in front of them. The technology is going to do it all on its own. So for resources, um, it would cost probably about $405 to make prototype. And we could get that from friends, family, and possibly Kickstart. Um, also, we probably need about $5,000 to start up production on a few prototypes. Thank you. Any questions? Can I ask one question? One quick question. Um, so I see the camera, I see the streaming. How soon would it tell the person is not going to put up? It's connected to like a microphone and the, the camera will scan in front of them and it'll warn them like, oh, possible cars ahead, crosswalk ahead, and it'll tell them to stop and it'll warn them to like not. So the object identification? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Excellent, very good. Um, so listen, they, they started off with a good pitch. I was sitting there when they said a lot of people were affected by it. I was thinking, okay, how many? And then they told me on the next slide, very impressive. Um, they set a nice bar there. Next up is White Edge, sharpening our community with Erin, Sophie, Ian, and Harry. On the campus at UMass Lowell, students who differ in majors may feel separated from each other. And the local charities and nonprofits in the community are suffering. Funding has dwindled to minimum amounts, and now more than ever, there's a stronger need for aid. We have an opportunity here. Lowell is a history rich community. We can reach our students, bringing them closer together than they ever were before. There's a greater demand for aid as poverty goes up. New, um, new nonprofits are expanding. One of the nonprofits we looked at exponentially was House of Hope, which has recently installed a new housing facility for families in need. Oh, this is our mantra, and uh, we believe that new people can make new connections and inspire new ideas and lead to more innovations. Um, our solution is White Edge, and we solve poverty and disparity in our city with a little bit of fun added in there. We host parties and events that hold silent auctions, raffles, food and music, and all our proceeds will go to local charities. 
We want to use our platform at the school to bring together all clubs and students, then branch out to cities and other neighborhoods. We can get our funding from local businesses. They could provide catering or simply different aids with different events. And uh, UMass Lowell could provide the initial space, but again, we are looking to branch out into the city of Lowell and probably eventually into the greater Boston area. However, we are still in our idea phase. Here is our budget. Uh, for you, we probably need about $1,500. This is for about an event of 200 people. And then we would need a um, couple hundred dollars for sound equipment and decorations, and then probably about 3,000 for sound equipment. And here are references. So, you know, I will ask you all questions. I don't want anybody to fail off anything. So, I'm, I'm sure you all heard, we just finished up our idea challenge event, which is, so this is sort of the entrance to Difference Maker, and we have a lot of different events, but how many of you, did any of you go to the idea challenge last week? Where we gave out $50,000 in prizes to student teams? That's real money. And the leading team, the winning team, Campus by Difference Maker, was a group of psychology and criminal justice students who are developing a website. It's called Operation 250. Anyone know what 250 represents? That's the number of American teenagers who were attracted to terrorist websites at one, in one year. And so these kids have developed a website that is meant to educate adolescents about these terrorist websites and how they use social media and such to sort of lure uh, young adults into it. So they were the campus wide difference maker. So we had some really interesting teams. I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we move through here. But next up is Squeeze to Heat. Miss Squeeze to Heat. That's Nick Glasser, Perla, and Ed. They're really going to make me work today. Huh? How's it going, everybody? All right. So we are Perla, Nick, and Ed, and we're squeezed to heat. So what's the problem here? Everybody's got cold hands. And it's anyone who lives in the cold, commuters like myself, people who are working labor fields, or even athletes. And what's even more interesting about cold hands is that it medically affects two groups specifically, Arthur Reynolds patients and those who suffer from arthritis. So our main market will be um, anyone with cold hands, obviously, but also 200,000 plus people are affected by rhino disease every year, and 52.5 million people in the world are affected by arthritis. And for a competition, there really isn't a good solution. All you have is the one-time use hand warmers that cost about $2 each, and you throw them out afterwards, or you can go in the higher end and get heated gloves that go anywhere from $80 to $260, and you have to make sure they're continuously charged. So here's our solution. Squeeze the heat. It's a one-time purchase that not only creates heat using a unique exothermic reaction between molecules that we actually have the chemical engineering department at UMass Lowell working on right now, but also in the process of creating heat, it also allows for circulation. So people who suffer from Arthur Reynolds and arthritis need this circulation or else their disease is gonna continue to get much worse, something we don't want to happen. Um, there's also a ton of huge branding in this because think about a ball like this, which is just our, uh, you know, test, uh, with a logo on it. It could basically be used for anybody and it could be sold in huge quantities. 
So for our resources, um, the product development would mostly be with the help of the difference maker. So um, we didn't put any money down for that, but we're going to market test it. We're hoping this to make a prototype and hand it out to people, specifically people with arthritis and arthritis, and get their feedback, and then go back and refine it, and then basically just go for inventory and advertising from there. Any questions? I was still trying to figure out the mic. Where to hold from. So you're developing this? Yes. And nothing like this exists. Nothing like it exists. It will basically make one-time use hand warmers obsolete because we don't know exactly how much it's going to cost, but there's no way it's going to cost more than ten dollars. And people who want a one-time use product are spending two bucks each time, and it's not even providing a product they like. Most people say it doesn't even provide enough heat. So. Multiple time use based on an exothermic reaction. Okay. Pretty insane. Right. Anybody have rain notes? Any up there have rain notes? Yeah, yeah, my wife and my daughter both have it. On our honeymoon, we were doing a little boat cruise down in Provincetown, we going whale watching, and all of a sudden my wife's fingertips like turned white, white, white from that rain. We didn't know she had it. I'll get, if you make these, I'll buy some for Christmas. So some of these ideas would be very good ideas for the Difference Maker Idea Challenge. Uh, let's see, QBell. Any, you're all business major, right? So there's no nursing or health science majors in here. One of the teams that won was QBell, which was a combination of business, computer science, and nursing, and they're developing a cell phone app that would, you know, if I, any of you been in the hospital and you had to push that little button to get the attention and then you wait and wait for the nurse and the nurse comes and says, what do you want? Their app would actually allow you to select, well, I need help getting up, I need food, I need the doctor. And so at the nurse's station, it would actually display what the problem is versus just lighting the light up. Pretty neat. Next up is Green Sphere with Eric, Peter, Colin, and Abigail. No one came? Yeah. They won't get any Right? There you go. And what's your name? Well, well my name's Peter. The rest of my group. All sick, I guess. Um, <laughs> we are representing the Green Sphere. So, quick question. Dunkin' Donuts, right? Everyone? Alright, I do too. Um, I go a couple times a week, I go, I get my coffee, I get my food, throw it away in the trash. I don't think I've ever recycled anything from Dunkin' Donuts. I don't think I've ever seen or recycled a bin of Dunkin' Donuts. And I'm not alone. About 73% of all PET plastics are not recycled responsibly. And Dunkin' Donuts products are no exception. Um, Dunkin' Donuts is a franchise that doesn't require a recycling system in their stores, so they just don't do it because it's too time consuming, it's too much money. But people are willing to recycle. We've done a survey of about over 20 people and talked even more, and every single person said they're either willing to or wanting to recycle in stores like Dunkin' Donuts. So that leaves the question, why don't people recycle? And to be honest, it's just a matter of lazy. So the parts of businesses and people. Businesses, they don't want to spend the money or the time to implement a recycling system, and people are either uneducated on how to recycle, or they just forget, or they just don't do it. So we try to cut out all the effort. We have a uh, two-part solution. First, so we're just going to implement our own recycling system in places like Dunkin' Donuts. We're going to put our own recycling bins in for two purposes. One, to educate people on what to recycle, where to recycle it, how to recycle it. The second part is actually making it accessible. So we'll put the recycling bins in. Us, as a company, will come pick it up, take all the effort out for the companies. And so it's like a win-win, why not? This is what it's gonna look like. Obviously, we're gonna have facts on it so people know the importance of recycling, how to recycle, when to recycle. For resources, 
Um, we're asking for about $11,000 from investors, um, $4,000 for the actual bins. There's a couple legal fees, but a lot of money will be saved because we are going to <clears throat> apply for donations from companies like Ford, GMC for our own trucks because again, we have to go and pick up things and that'll cut out a lot of money. And yeah. Any questions? That's actually a problem we ran into. So the people, I mean, I know a lot of you probably don't actually recycle there. Um, we actually thought about that. So there was a study done and roughly 20% actually do throw away their stuff at Dunkin' Donuts. So obviously 20% is a lot better than zero. Also, since we thought about that, we were thinking about potentially putting these recycling bins out through the drive-thru because a lot of people, they'll get their dunks, they'll get their coffees, and then later in the day or the next day, they'll just keep it in there. They always throw it in the trap, uh, trash out there. And, so, yeah. and also, the part, uh, it's meant to educate. So when you just see the recycling bins there, it's actually making a change. You're going to know how to recycle. Did you like this slide? No. <laughs> That's a no, no, no. We've had this question, actually. We had this question during class, too. Oh, yeah. It was a big problem. Did you talk about the audience to see if they'd be interested in paying you? Uh, yeah, well, first of all, I don't know if I mentioned, we're also a non-profit, so it's not going to take too much money, just the initial cost. But um, our group leader, Eric, not here unfortunately, he actually works at Dunkin' Donuts, and they were the ones who said that um, they have their own recycling systems, like, like, even though it's a franchise, like, they each decide how they dispose of their products. So um, they said they'd be willing to try something like that, because it's, good. it's a good look for their business, too. So we've gotten some... Like one. So do me a favor and text your friends that were here and tell them that the white kids to make sure they don't get the twenty-five dollar <laughs> Nice job, thank you. All right, so if any of others of you are missing your teammates, you might want to text them and tell them I'll be personally looking for them tonight. Sam, Nicole, and Amber, and all four of you in here, thank you. Who's going to talk? All right, good luck. All right, hi, I'm Jack. This is Amber, Sam, and Nicole, and we are in Print Alarms. Who here lives with Fox Hogs by a show of hands? And who here gets annoyed by waking up at 2 a.m. and having to go downstairs for a fire alarm? So that is our problem that we've decided to address. The problem is these prank fire alarms, people think it's funny to pull the fire alarm, it's affecting residence halls, not only Fox Hall, but across the country. Roughly 20 fire alarms were just pranks that happened in the fall semester of uh, this year. Thanks to this problem, it deprives students of sleep, they, they get behind on work and behind on their sleep, it endangers students. Um, I've, seen, I've seen a girl pass out out there, actually. And it cost the university thousands of dollars for the fire department to come in, clear the building, and then, and then leave. Um, so what is the opportunity with this product? Um, this isn't just an issue, as we said, only here, but at all college campuses. And the only other product on the market right now for this is called Tamper Dye. It's applied to the handle of the fire alarm. And the idea is that when you pull it, um, it will turn the person's hand blue so that you can identify them later. Um, our product would be superior to this because uh, it gives the administration an actual piece of evidence to use to find the person, and um, also it would deter someone from calling the alarm as a prank because you would know that there's a fingerprint scanner on the alarm. All right, so for the solution, um, we will install a fingerprint scanner in the problematic residence halls uh, like Fox. Um, this will solve our problem because students will be afraid to activate it as a prank. Um, it will also allow the school to weed out a list of possible suspects by using the fingerprint matching. And um, our, prob our solution is relatively cheap and the scanners are easy to install. Around 
dollars, um, but what we would need actual funding for would be installing them on all the farm arms and the residence halls, um, specifically farms. Um, so the funding would, we would probably look for through the university, um, seeing it is just a problem here. But we would also need expertise from fire departments to know that it's something that won't stop the fire alarm from going off in case there actually was an emergency. Thank you. There's like five or six per floor, 18 yeah. floors. So how much would it cost to swing your bed? Uh, it could be like $5,000. Yeah. So could, could, you, could you balance that off against what they might have to pay? <coughs> yeah, so every night it's like $1,000 for the fire department to come through the building. That's five nights. <laughs> and that won't happen. I mean, it happened 20 times in the fall. So. And are you familiar with the technology? Yeah, so we all have iPhones, and um, I guess we all, we all we don't have Android, but there's just a fingerprint scanner, and it would be similar to that. And we also looked into other technologies. Obviously, our first thing was like, oh, a camera. We can take a picture of the, um, of the person pulling the fire alarm, but that's actually can't have those in residence halls, like living areas. So then we went to our second idea, which would be a fingerprint, just like our iPhones. Did you talk to anyone in the Yeah, I've talked to a couple of others. Oh yeah, they thought they were, they thought it would be good, good idea. So. Good job. So we're missing for now, but yeah, this is fine. Um, all right, to show of hands, how many people had a glass of water today or drink from water bottle? So we're in 2017, and there's still countries who, who do not have access to clean water. So on the right is a graph of population compared to clean water. So America is the highest because we're one of the more technologically advanced countries. But going over to like Africa and Asia, where the population is so high and the amount of dirty water that they have access to is so small, you're unable to really allow yourself to have clean water, which causes issues in India, which has a large population but low amounts of water. So according to the CDC, which is uh, WASH, is like their global water and sanitation and hygiene. Um, so Sub-Saharan Africa has 31% has access to clean water, 33% of South Asia has access, and then 35% of Eastern Asia has access. That is well below the roughly 84% that America has, because there are some parts of America that don't have the best access to clean water. Seven out of 10 people without access, or have without access, ugh, wow, that was bad. Seven out of 10 people in rural areas have no access to clean water. Um, so this is a, sorry, my drawing is very bad, but there's no really sketch or idea, or very good model of what we had for an idea. So it's, think of like an ice cream cone. As you get towards the bottom, the center of it gets smaller. So every foot that you have in between each grate is gonna be sand and charcoal. So as water dips down through, the sand and the charcoal will filtrate water until it hits the bottom, and then in the bottom, you'll have roughly a 30 gallon basin of clean water. Now the water itself is gonna be roughly four feet underground, which will make the water itself 10 degrees cooler. So if you're in Africa and it's like 105 degrees daily, by drinking 10 degree, 10 degree cooler water on a regular basis, your body, your body absorbs the water more than you would have prior to that. Um, so then in our general structure, we're made of clay with a metal like netting on the inside. So what we'll be able to happen is say if something breaks, all they have to do is take clean or dirty water, mix it with mud and heat it, and it'll make its own adhesive so we don't have to go out there personally and fix whatever happens to there, to our mud. So a lot of what we have to do is advertising and transportation because if we're leaving America with our product, then that's what costs us the most. 
Um, a lot of this would be grants, Kickstarters, or a GoFundMe page, and a lot of it would be going towards the metal and the charcoal that we'd have to put into our design. But besides that, we're kind of just in a product idea phase and nothing like this. Similar ideas to this, where they're either made of like, you've seen like the water bottle things, where like you can flip over a water bottle and have the sand go down with the water, and it makes like clean water towards the bottom, but there's no general big idea that's roughly like an eight-foot scale that we have, so, yeah. Questions? Sticks to the cars, is difficult to remove, and over time it can break windshields. As a result, the car after the storm, the car is not left looking shiny and new like it was before. This is important because of our opportunity. There are 2,500 car dealerships in just the New England area. Many of them have hundreds of cars. We plan to implement our product here in car dealerships because it's important to them that their cars are shiny and new even after snowstorms. Also, another, pl another place we can capitalize is our competitors. Uh, our products are their, our competitors' products sorry, are expensive and their function is not as, they do not function as well as ours. Our solution. The backbone of our company is innovation. We have a two-layer cover. The bottom layer which touches the car will be soft as to not scratch the car when you remove it. The top will be a new hydrophobic material that allows the snow to slide off the car as it accumulates. Also, it's easily removable because of its light weight, and it covers the whole car. This seems simple, but many of our competitors, if it covers the whole car, it's permanent, or if it will just cover the windshield or the mirrors. Also, it's less mess because of the hydrophobic material. The snow will slide off of it uh, before it starts to collect, and so when you throw it in your trunk, it won't melt. Also, we have three small supports you can put in, one under the trunk, roof, and hood. And what this does, it just improves the functionality of it and even more snow will slide off before it accumulates. And you're essentially just lifting the weight of the cover when you pull it off. Also, handles. Although it seems simple, many of our competitors don't have handles and that will give us a leg up in the market. Resources. Uh, we expect about $200 for the bottom layer and $800 for the new hydrophobic material and then about $500 for testing. It's also important that we have mentoring because we're all physics majors here, so that's the only aspect we know. It's important that we get engineering help and um, help with our materials so we know our way around our market and our product. Thank you. Any questions? Did you like that idea? Would you, would you put it on? <laughs> <laughs> we'll save us some time. I don't know, it might be... I'm not sure. Yep. Next up is Team Solution. 
And that's Nicole, Nick, and Billy. And I see Nicole and Nick. <laughs> I'm Nick. And I'm Nicole, and we're Team Solution. So one in four undergraduate female students is sexually assaulted or raped. And for the guys in the room, you might not think that this is an issue for you. You have to think. This could be your sister, your girlfriend, your friend. And for the girls in the room, it could be you. So we develop no heel. The problem is women often feel unsafe when they go out wearing heels. It makes them a very easy target for sexual assault because it's hard to run in heels. And women just want to feel safe. And you can even see models up here, they can have difficulty walking in heels. So we interviewed 50 female undergraduate students and 86% said they don't feel comfortable walking home at night. 14% said they don't really go out that much. 86% claimed that they wore heels when they went out. 4% said they carried a weapon. And 82 said they'd been catcalled on the streets. And so the solution is detachable heels that also can be So they're cute and killer. Ha <laughs> ha. And so basically how it works is the heel slides right off and on the heel there's a button that user dispenses uh, pepper spray or a knife. So not only can you run away, but if they get too close and you feel like you can take them, you got the weapon. You're good. You're all set. So we think roughly our total will be around $3,000. Um, materials around $1,000. To design prototypes, $105. And the production of 35 pairs to distribute out to undergraduate females is around a um, thousand as well. And labor is 500. And so to go into more detail, it's going to take about $30 to make the shoe. Um, minimum wage is $11 an hour. Uh, right now we can use the university as a space, but in the future to rent out a space will be 300 per person. And social media will be what we will use to advertise and very big on social media, so we can accomplish that. Thank you. <laughs> this isn't that. I mean, this is kind of hard, you know, walking in heels. So, is the idea if you would have your own line of shoes, or would you make it a Oh No, we would have our own line of shoes. We'd start with black because was pretty much everything, and then once we kind of get more successful, we'll go for a job to different colors. Any other questions? Yes. <laughs> I don't think that will happen. Um, just like any other weapon, you know, if you carry pepper spray, there's always that like small chance you're gonna spray yourself in the eye. I mean, most people aren't, but. I mean, if you're gonna ask that question, you know, you just gotta think, it's a weapon, you gotta be safe. Any other questions? <laughs> Thanks very much. Good luck to your students. Remember, the customer is always right, or the potential customer. All right, now we're ready for our late afternoon snack there with a uh, healthy bunch with Annalise, Dominic, and Isla. Isla? I said so. She's not here, so don't tell her I missed it. Click her. Good afternoon. I'm Dominic. This is Annalise. Hold up. Nice and close. Right now. Can you hear me better? This is a healthy bunch so a common problem we find at UMass Lowell is the dining hall. Kids are constantly saying there's not enough healthy options. It's a very limited variety. There's a lack of fresh fruits and vegetables. And for people with dietary restrictions, it's a struggle for them to find food. Uh, in a survey we did at UMass Lowell students, 66.7% of students said there are not enough healthy options. 
71.8% of students said they cannot maintain a healthy diet, and about 98% of students said there's room for improvements. Some quotes they have, very frustrated with the lack of healthy options. You've probably all said these things yourselves. So our solution for our company, Healthy Munchin, will be creating new, exciting, healthy meals that will promote a healthy lifestyle. We'll be utilizing local produce services as well as connect, partnering with culinary schools to bring in culinary students to cook the meals which will promote learning for the students for the culinary students themselves in order to learn how to cook cook new meals and to learn how to work in a real kitchen we'll also be encouraging constant feedback from the students and we'll be adapting our meal menus to what all the students want, needs and wants for our resources, we'll be asking for $16,500. This will be divided between marketing for 10,000 meal samples to be introduced for $4,500, as well as wages for $2,000. Thank you. Are there any questions? and there's only, only so many washers and dryers available for these students to use. And then students, they go to do their laundry, let them go down to the laundry room, oftentimes on a different floor, um, call their laundry with them, just to find that there aren't any washers and dryers available. And we surveyed 25 students in the laundry room, and they found that this is an inconvenience for 60% of students living on campus, as we're all busy, we should, our day shouldn't revolve around doing laundry. So our target market would be the students who live on campus at UMass Lowell and do the laundry. Um, many colleges offer services that do the laundry for them, but that could be pretty expensive, and ranging anywhere from 200 to 400 per semester. And none of the students that we survey were willing to pay that. And then there are other colleges who have mobile apps that track the availability of washers, but they can be quite expensive as well, and they offer additional services on how to do their laundry to make it more expensive and then there are 96% of the students that we surveyed that would be willing and that would think a level lab tracking would help them like do laundry. So our solution it is a mobile app that tracks the availability of washers and dryers so you can see up on the screen there it'll show um, if each individual machine is in use or available and if it is in use it says how much time is left in the cycle and our solution, we're not going to offer those additional services on like how do you clean certain types of stains and how to um, just like do your laundry in general. So this is more affordable for UMass Lowell to purchase. So the UMass, UMass Lowell would purchase this. This wouldn't be any additional charge for students. So this would be included in the room and board. And so this is more affordable for a public school as compared to the private institutions that might be able to have more money to pay for more expensive service. And with our solution, students, um, we need to do laundry, they'll know how much longer they have to wait for without having to physically check the laundry room. So, 
So for our resources, we um, estimated that a total, our total expenses over a six month period would be $13,950. Um, after doing research, we found that um, app development would cost about $7,000. Um, since our app is pretty small, um, that's the amount it is. Usually bigger apps go, like their development could cost between $100,000 to $500,000. Marketing and promoting, um, like flyers and keeping you guys updated on um, the release of uh, our product would be approximately $5,000. Our product release is actually not expensive since it's just we're just releasing the product. It would be $200, um, but keeping it going and like fixing bugs um, and um, and problems with the app, it would cost, it would, upkeep would cost about $1,000 and incorporating as a business and um, in Massachusetts, it's about $250, but um, other expenses such as um, getting people to work with us and finding um, personnel would total us to about $750. Thank you. So what the competition does for like the other companies that have these similar services, they give each university an individual quote based on how many residence halls do they have, how many washers and dryers. So we wouldn't be able to give any. That's what would have to do. We wouldn't be able to give an exact price until we evaluate exactly how. Would would have to evaluate first. We can't. We can't. We can't really. Well, we can't really figure out what that meant. Yeah, that's another benefit if we go back to this slide, how it shows, so when your washer, so say for example, you know that your clothes are in washer number two, it'll say you have eight minutes left, so this also saves the issue of people leaving their laundry in the machines without knowing that it's done. I like this idea, you talk to Rez about No, we haven't, because since we're still in the idea stage, we wouldn't want to um, try to sell them a product that isn't developed yet. You know, I have to say, I am impressed at the number of you that have done surveys and actually done some research on what it might take to implement something like this. Pretty impressive, Holly. Not Holly. Pretty impressive. CTX, Cleaning Transportation Experience, CTX. Is that real? <laughs> All right, so we have Charles, Alexander, and Todd. You guys are up. Good afternoon. This is Charles and Alexander, and here at CTX. How many of you guys like riding a bike? So I see a lot of hands. So uh, the problem is that is there air pollution from factories, automobiles? have been harming the earth people for many years, especially in third world countries. And, uh, for example, such as China, India, and Saudi Arabia, and the uh, uh, most affected ages are between zero and six, those with asthma, uh, pregnant mothers, and people 55 plus who have trouble breathing. And in 2015, only eight of 74 major Chinese cities met the national standards of air quality and almost half of the, United, of the U.S. population lives in areas where the air pollution is nearing unsafe to breathe. And there's a high usage of bicycles everywhere, especially in Asian countries. Our solution is an air filter that attaches to bicycles. It would filter out the harsh chemicals in the air and produces clean air as the bike moves forward and it will push it right up in your face so you have to breathe in clean air instead of dirty air. And it gives people an inexpensive way to help the environment daily. The resources that we need are mechanical and electrical engineers along with environmentalists. 
We will need to help, help the help of large bicycle companies, and we will need to use funding from filter, from uh, to research the filter capabilities. And in total, we will think about about forty thousand dollars for the all the research and five thousand dollars for the development of the product. And this is a rough mock up of the bike. And on the back, the solar panel will be to help provide electricity so we can power a GPS unit that we have on it, which we plan on implementing. In, uh, planning on implementing it in, with uh, bike check programs, which are everywhere now and they're growing rapidly, and it provides a way for the cities to allow people to go around and clean the air on their daily um, transportation from work to home. No joking. Questions, comments? <laughs> Be a two-part system where you could buy just the filter that attaches to bicycles, or you could buy the full bike, which would then have the solar panel and it would be your top water efficient. So you could either go or two ways. Okay. Did they finish early? Oh. Are you timing me? Come on, I'm the boss, okay? Don't be timing me. All right. Academia Tech. Oh, we got a fan club here. Whoa. Carter, Pam, Shane, and Kelly are going to present Academia Taxes. Everyone hear me? Yeah? Yeah? Good? Okay, two questions. How many, how many of you have been late to class or had to rush because of the bus system? Yeah? Yeah? Okay. I don't believe it. Second question. How many of you had wanted to go to go home for the weekend or run to the store to grab snacks or something that you need, but you have no way of getting there? Here's your hands. Want to go home for the weekend? All right. So when we were meeting for this project, we identified those two problems. So our two major issues is that the bus system, it's hard to rely on them to travel in between classes and make sure you get there on time. And then also, there's really no method of getting home for the weekend, or if you want to run to market basket to grab a box of cereal or something. So we created Academia Taxi, and what this is, is that it essentially allows you to ride share, similar to Uber or Lyft, and it addresses the two issues that we have here at UMass Lowell. Um, and so, for the opportunity, we interviewed a few students, and 82% of them said that they wish there was an alternative to the shuttles because you really can't rely on them. And there's been so many times that people have been late or they've had to rush to class. And about 76% of students said that they couldn't afford to take an Uber or a Lyft home for the weekend, which really shouldn't happen because it's hard for students who don't have cars to get home to see their family when they live so far away from their houses. And it's an honor to talk more about the app. So now you guys may be asking, what makes us different than Uber and all these other things? Uh, so we're actually an alternative payment method company. And so what we mean by that is we're an app, and so you go onto the app, and you can use alternative forms of payment, such as bartering. And our big thing is we set up this in advance. So you say, I need to ride in two weeks home. And then you're like, all right, how am I going to pay for it? And you'd be like, all right, I got the gas, I got the snacks. Or you're like, all right, I need to ride from East Campus to South Campus. How about I get an hour of tutoring? So it really is only for students. and. Um, that's one of the things we're doing is we're actually having student-only email registration, so it's only students allowed in it, and uh, so only students are allowed, and then they can cho they choose, they can do, all right, I want an hour of tutoring, or I want two slices of pizza for a ride from East Campus to North Campus, so students kind of set how their payment, and then also they can have it, so we will have it so you can pay with cash and um, cards, so kind of like Uber, you just click it, and it's all set, and we will take a fee of that, um, and then so our resources, so all of our revenue is going to be made from advertisements. So say someone is like, all right, I want to pay with bartering, I want to pay with tutoring. Um, they click that option on the app, and then 30-second ad pops up. I'm sure everyone of you has had that happen to you 
at some point, you hate it, you can't skip it, that's how we're gonna make our money. Uh, and so for our initial funds, it's $600 put up by four group members, and then the biggest thing, and our biggest uh, fund, is the fact that we have a software development company, um, is one of my friend's company, and they're actually getting a 12% stake in the company in return for designing the app for free, and all of the updates and stuff are free. So thank you, do you guys have any questions? safer than having to deal with like, adults and stuff like that, but still, so that's just like, going to be our main Sometimes. <laughs> Real money, right? Real money. The teams, all ten teams that made it to the finals, received received some money between a thousand, a thousand, I think, up to five thousand dollars. Plus, three of the teams will get five thousand dollars in free legal services to file a patent to form a company. So it's real money, and uh, I think some of these ideas. I mean, you're freshmen. You put some work. You find that engineer, that science major that you need to work with. Um, you could go places with some of these. I like it. You know, in addition, we're going to have our last team up in a minute, but the university also has an investment fund where we raise money from outside the university and then we invest it in our, in our companies so we can actually make a $50,000 investment in a university affiliated technology. We get equity, the company gets 50 grand, and that helps them to raise additional money. So this is really, it's really possible to move these ideas forward. The last team up, Lucky 13, is uh, Don't Leave Me Hanging, with Faith, Danny, Anthony, and Prithika. So the problem, I know everybody here has definitely at one time in their life used a hanger. So for us, the problem is, is how hard it is to sometimes put the hanger from the bottom of the shirt. Um, hangers usually don't last a long time and they easily break. As you can see in the image on the right, wire hangers, plastic hangers, those easily break over time. Um, and our main target is young children and mentally challenged individuals are having a very hard time putting their clothes on hangers when they have to. Our opportunity, uh, again, there's 36 uh, million children ages 5 to 15 in the U.S. There's also a large group of mentally challenged um, individuals. Um, we see an opportunity because as, although there's been a lot of innovation in clothes hangers, um, their inventions to save space. The first image is the Wonder Hanger, which allows you to hang five garments in the space of one. The second image is M&B Hangers, which makes um, different shape hangers which allows you to hang different types of garments, but there's no hangers that makes it easier to hang clothes. All right, so now our solution. So don't leave me hanging. As you can see here, there's a perfect wooden hanger and it actually folds in half. Um, so you can easily slide that in through the top of the shirt, through the neck without having to stretch that out. Um, it has a hinge here, as you can see, and uh, the product is an innovation to obviously typical hangers uh, that we use today and it's one of a kind you don't really find these anywhere um, and over time we'll, we're planning on sustaining it through the sales of it because the cost of making it is basically so cheap 
that we can sell it at around a 300% profit. The resources we would need is mostly marketing. Um, we'd want to build our own website, um, so we could probably get a student to help us out with that. We'd also need to create more prototypes, because although this is great, um, we don't want a huge hinge on the clothes hanger, not very um, aesthetically pleasing. Um, but we could do this all with about $500 that we get from either winnings or investments. Fantastic job. Uh, I think we should give them three credits for this course. Yeah. 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 Okay, I'm going to take, take over here now. All right, so how many of you have a cell phone with you? It's time to text vote for the winners. Have you done this before? You did it at convocation, but that was like six, eight months ago. So. You got them all on there. Okay. Do you need a, a, an update on what each of the teams do? Or do you know them by now? You all know them, okay. So get out your phones. Uh, let's see. What's text difference? Charlie, I'll let you introduce this, it changed. <laughs>
Second place winner is Green Sphere. Where is Green Sphere? All right, and then we have a tie. We have a tie. Squeeze the heat and seeing eye. So where are they? Come on up. Let's see. We're seeing eye, right? Okay, so you stand over here. Kelly, do we have enough cards? We do. And y'all, stand here. All right, and we have more gift cards. You can use those to buy your books, or at least the page. There you go. All right. Very good. Thanks very much. Great job.